Let's now talk about another threat, uh, uh, climate change. And, um, you know, so much of climate change is uh, so uh, baked in while we have this political debate of whether it's real or not uh, that, can, that persists even in this uh, election year. Um, you have to remember that uh, even if carbon dioxide emissions cease today, which is a fanciful notion, of course, the climate would continue to warm for hundreds, really thousands of years. Uh, and it will take how long it would take to decarbonize our economy um, is anybody's guess. I don't know. Uh, our next guess will have, a, have more than a guess. Uh, the real bottom line here is that we have to get pretty serious about adaptation because that's, it's happening regardless of uh, even if we did get serious today. Uh, our next speaker is the Sturgis Hooper Professor of Geology, Professor of Environmental Science and Engineering at Harvard, and Director of the Harvard University Center for the Environment. Please welcome Daniel Schrag. Thank you. Uh, just a second ago, Ruth whispered to me, don't blow my optimistic message. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Ruth, it's just not my nature. It's hard to be a geologist who studies climate change Climate is a really big problem. I also, about 15 years ago, was tired of just talking about climate change, and I actually wanted to understand what I could do about it. So I started studying energy technology and policy as well. Um, and unfortunately, that, as I will describe to you briefly in the beginning of this talk, that makes it look even a little bit darker. Because uh, unfortunately, what Ruth just told you about the growth of industrial food production was on the backs of cheap energy in the form of fossil fuel. And that's the heart of our problem. And unfortunately, uh, solving that problem is really expensive and unfortunately has a very long time scale because it involves massive infrastructure. It is not like information technology or biotechnology. You know, we think of how quickly the internet has changed the world. That's not the case with energy technology, and there's a good reason for that, because it involves hundreds of trillions of dollars of infrastructure. And so the time scale is inherently slow. I wish it were faster, and in fact, most of my work is trying to figure out how to accelerate it, how to speed it up, how to figure out some loophole where we can dramatically change the world quickly. And, and sometimes I am more optimistic, but what, what Dan Lieberman asked me to speak about today was really to think about this problem in the context of evolution. And I must admit, I don't usually think about evolution. So I, I, um, uh, it was an interesting challenge. So I want to share with you some thoughts. Um, but I'm going to talk very briefly about climate change first. This is, of course, the famous Keeling curve. Dave Keeling started measuring atmospheric carbon dioxide in the uh, late 50s. It was about 315 parts per million. He died in 2005. It was about, about 380 parts per million. Uh, and, uh, Today, it's well above 400 parts per million. Um, but you know, to many people, you know, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. That's been known for 100 years. It's going up. We know it's because of burning of fossil fuels. Indeed, only about 60% of the CO2 we produce from fossil fuels stays in the air. About 40% is taken up by the land and the ocean. Um, but this doesn't really do this justice. So to me, I always think about the problem in this context. So this now shows data from an ice core showing temperature in the middle, and this is carbon dioxide concentration reconstructed in bubbles in the ice. And this is methane, the second most important greenhouse gas. And you can see today methane is about 1,800 parts per million, and CO2 is a little bit above 400 parts per million. Never in the last 800,000 years has CO2 been above 300 parts per million or below 180 parts per million until now. So breathe deeply. You are experiencing something that no other human has ever, no other human society has ever experienced. No other hominid species has ever experienced because probably CO2 hasn't been this high for five or six million years and maybe not 35 or 36 million years ago. So this is a, a geological experiment we're doing on the planet. Um, and normally I would talk to you a lot more about that. I don't want to talk about that today because I do want to talk about the question what is this going to do in the long run to evolution? Um, I, I must say, um, we could talk for a long time about energy technology. I want to just show you this cartoon to sum up 
how I think about this problem. This is an actual cartoon from 1861 from Vanity Fair showing the ball that the whales threw to celebrate the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania. And this is funny. It's also, to me, a little depressing for the following reason. You know, um, it's, it's sort of true. But the point is, we didn't stop hunting whales because we cared about the whales. Now, let me be very clear. I care about the whales. But humans who lived in the 19th century didn't stop hunting whales because they cared about the whales. They stopped because they found something else that was cheaper and better. And that worries me because it's really hard to find something that's cheaper and better than fossil fuels in the way that we value them. Look around you. Go outside. Look at the cars on the street. You'll realize this is a really hard problem. And cars are the tip of the iceberg. There's diesel trucks and jet planes and electricity and all of the things that we use electricity for and where that comes from. And replacing this all over the world because this is a global problem that is in some ways the, the worst collective action problem in the world because it requires collective responsibility and, and commitment by everyone sustained, and the time scales are really long. So the one thing I want to tell you about energy technology from having worked in this for a long time is that a silver bullet solution is not around the corner. It will require innovative investments in technology and innovation sustained for the better part of at least 100 years and probably longer. And so it's a, in some ways, the, the, I, I really admire the student activists who are committed to doing something about climate change because this isn't like other social movements. This is a social movement that has to be sustained for over 100 years. It's really, really difficult. And another day we could talk about what the solution looks like, but let me come back to what Stuart was talking about. There's no question that today biodiversity is threatened primarily by land use, although climate is going to come along and do the job. And, and Stuart, I, I totally admire what you do by building that that connector between the forests and replanting those forests. But I got to tell you, 50 years from now, climate change is going to come and wipe the map clean. Because all that great work in connecting those pieces of land, and then the climate changes, as long if they're still stuck in that slightly larger forest, they're, they're going to be in trouble. So the, while climate change may not yet have had its huge impact on biodiversity, just wait. What's coming is really extraordinary. Because we were likely to see four, maybe even six degrees of warming over the next 100 years. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's something that the world hasn't seen for, as I said, tens of millions of years. But worse than that, it's happening more than 100 times faster than the rate of natural climate change that we've experienced in the past. So the one other co scientific concept I want to make sure you understand that you leave this talk with is the long time scales of climate change. As a geologist, I sometimes think about the different time scale, climate time scales. And this is one that my colleague David Archer at Chicago has spent a lot of time talking about. Um, as I told you, 60% of our CO2 emissions remain in the air right away. And about 40% are taken up by the land and the ocean. So the, the Earth is actually giving us a little cushion. We're actually, it's actually providing. That may not persist, by the way. But, but right now, it is doing that. And it's been doing that for quite a while. Um, but more than half of this airborne fraction will still be there a 1,000 years from now. And probably a third of it, right, or something like 20 to 25% of the CO2 we put in the air, will still be there 20,000 years from now. And that will remain and slowly diminish over the next 100 to 150,000 years. So the decisions we're making today about what kind of energy technology we're building, what kind of infrastructure we're building, will affect the Earth not just for your children and grandchildren. We're talking about for thousands of generations. It's hard to even fathom that kind of time scale and responsibility. Certainly, the political system and the business cycles don't think about this at all. And economists would question whether something 1,000 years from now, much less 100,000 years from now, is valued at anything. At a discount rate, it's worth nothing. And yet, to me, that asks the wrong question. A discount rate, for those of you who think about economics, asks, what are we willing to pay to avoid some damage in the distant future? And most of us, it turns out, if you actually look at data, are not willing to pay much for some damage that's 100 years from now, especially not even a, 
especially not a thousand years from now or ten thousand years from now. But that's not really the question that we have to ask. The question we have to ask is, what moral responsibility do we have to provide or allow future generations, most of them not yet born, to have the same kind of opportunities that we've enjoyed to prosper? To me, that's the fundamental difference. This isn't really about how much are we willing to pay. The answer is we're not willing to pay very much. But maybe we have to think about what we, we should pay, what we need to pay. Because we're doing something extraordinary to the planet. And let me just you know, illustrate this. This is a figure from David Archer showing what happens if you emitted a 5,000 billion ton pulse of CO2. To put this in perspective, this is what would happen if we continued to use coal and oil and gas, but especially coal, over the next few hundred years. So if we continue to do what we're doing for the next few hundred years, even slowing down but steady and continue to do this for a few hundred years, we will put about 5,000 billion tons of carbon in the atmosphere. We've already put over 500. We are absolutely going to put 1,000. And I would say most likely we'll probably do two or 3,000. If we get to 5,000, this is what might happen. This would be instantaneous. You see CO2 levels going up to 2,500 parts per million. If we did it over a few centuries, it wouldn't go quite that high. It might only go to about 1,900 or 2,000 parts per million. Remember, today we're at 400, which is higher than anything we've seen for millions of years. And then it comes down and plateaus somewhere around 1,000 parts per million. And these are just different carbon cycle models. But you see now the time scale has increased. This is 10,000 years. And it plateaus that way out to 100,000 years. This transforms the planet. It's a completely different world. It's, it's really close to a time period about 50 million years ago called the Eocene, when we think CO2 levels were about this high. But instead of a slow, steady change from the Eocene to today that happened over tens of millions of years, this is happening in a few hundred years, and then persisting for hundreds of thousands of years. There's one other time scale that's potentially really long, and that's if we deglaciate Antarctica. I, I believe that Greenland is completely gone. Not today, but that is, we've already guaranteed that all of the Greenland ice sheet will melt. What we don't know is how long. It may take 1,000 years. It may take several thousand years. There's about seven meters of sea level equivalent on Greenland. So I think we are already committed to seeing that. And we're probably see committed to seeing another 5 to 10 meters from Antarctica. But Antarctica is really big. Antarctica has about 50 meters of sea level equivalent on it, and um, maybe a little bit more even. And uh, uh, the question is, will we turn things around? Will we keep Antarctica from deglaciating? Because if it deglaciates, the geologic record suggests that it may take a million to two million years for the ice sheet to regrow. So the recovery of the Earth system, in the long run, the Earth system will be fine. It just may be that we actually imprint a one to two million year time scale, which is really extraordinarily long. And these are great pictures that uh, National Geographic showed of what this would look like if, if Antarctica deglaciated. You see the, the water here. You see what happens to the US, where uh, pretty much the whole East Coast is gone. Um, here's uh, Asia with massive all the great cities of Asia completely underwater. Very different world. Um, so what does this mean for evolution? This is a picture of Cretaceous, 65 million years ago and before. This would be a landscape. Here's what the oceans would look like with all these giant marine reptiles, extraordinary creatures that my son could rattle off their names when he was four. Uh, I've forgotten them all now. Um, and then along came a, a big extinction, we think caused by a meteorite impact. And this is the Eocene, or the Paleocene. And you see all the, these large mammals rocking around. This is an artist's rendition of what an Eocene landscape might look like. And this would be uh, you know, the oceans at the same time, full of sharks and early whales and a uh, variety of marine mammals and fish like today. But gone are the nautiluses, the, the, the nautiloids and the, and the uh, um, some of the other extraordinary uh, creatures that lived in the Cretaceous seas. So how do we think about the mass extinction that Stuart talked about? A thousand times the, the normal rate. I suspect that was going to go up dramatically. So how do we think about that in the context of climate change? Unfortunately, I think that um, 
humans are incredibly adaptable. Humans will do great with climate, but I think, uh, uh, I think it's going to be very hard to predict what's going to happen. There's no question that the biosphere will recover. Biodiversity will be fine in the long run. After the Permian extinction, the trilobites disappeared, and, re and reptiles became dominant. And after the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, reptiles disappeared, and the mammals became dominant. But if you lived right back then and you saw this little shrew-like thing, it would be hard to predict 64 million years ago that this guy was going to become whales and elephants and horses and people. Right? So I actually think it's a very interesting question to think about, but it's very hard to predict what might actually happen. Um, what about will humans evolve? Will humans actually change because of climate change? Um, the problem is we're already changing so fast from all sorts of other influences, especially, I think, technology. And I want, you'll, hope you'll humor me. I, just, I began to think about this in the context of science fiction. You know, different views, versions of the future. This is the original Mad Max. This is an apocalyptic vision of the future where natural selection plays out on the roads with guns and various other weapons and how fast you can drive a car and fix a car. Um, but here's another view of the future. This is another apocalyptic vision. My son used to love this one. This is Wall-E, uh, the robot who basically is a trash collecting robot in a world that has lost most life except for a cockroach, who is his best friend. And uh, somehow Wally goes off to visit the spaceship where the people are still living. But what's interesting about this movie, this is actually a very intelligent movie. The people have evolved. This is what they look like. They have evolved to be big couch potatoes. They can't walk anymore. Their bone structure has changed. And they've evolved with technology, which is sort of interesting. I think this is a, a very interesting commentary. Um, there are other ideas about the coevolution of technology and people. This is Star Trek. This is one of considered by many Star Trek aficionados the worst episode ever made. But it, it's uh, where Star Trek, Spock's brain gets stolen and used to run the collective, a centralized brain. But another version of this idea is this, which is the Borg. Um, there may be Star Trek fans in the audience, but what this is is a collective. This is an evil villain that is a collective of millions of individuals who are assimilated into the Borg. And so they have organisms that then get taken over with these kind of electronic gadgets. This is Captain Picard from the Enterprise, who has been now assimilated into the Borg. And he is kind of a, a hybrid machine person. And the famous saying of the Borg is, we are the Borg. Your biological and technological distinctiveness will be added to our own. Resistance is futile. I looked at this and I thought, hmm, that reminds me of something. This is, <laughs> right? So you could sort of say, we are Google. <laughs> um, but seriously, humans with technology, uh, I think with biotechnology, genetic technology, the question is, how do we think about human evolution in that context? And here's sort of where I ended up. I think. An important lesson from climate is not about climate change as a driver of evolution, because I suspect that's probably of, of human evolution. It's certainly going to drive the rest of evolution. But the question is really, is technology at the point now where we are no longer just the objects of evolution, but we are actually controlling it? We are doing the selection, either intentionally or otherwise. And the question is, do we have the wisdom to do it properly? I would say most certainly right now we don't. And I want to leave you with a final quote, which is from Rachel Carson. I don't know how many of you have actually read Silent Spring. It reads a little bit like a textbook in organic chemistry. But, um, but there's some poetry scattered in it that is just extraordinary. And this is what she says. The control of nature is a phrase conceived in arrogance, born of the Neanderthal age of biology and philosophy, when it was supposed that nature exists for the convenience of man. The concepts and practices of applied entomology, for the most part, date from that stone age of science. It is our alarming misfortune that so primitive a science has armed itself with the most modern and terrible weapons, and that in turning them against the insects, it has also turned them against the earth. Of course, she was talking about pesticides but, and DDT. But the question is, if she were here today, what would she think about the control of nature that we have today? I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, 
Just one, one thought before we go to intermission. What, what, what do you think about geoengineering? So I actually was going to put this in the talk, but I was getting a little long. It already was a little long. Um, so I work on geoengineering, and, and specifically, solar geoengineering is the idea that you can actually put aerosols in the stratosphere, reflect sunlight, and cool the Earth. Let me be very clear. It is not a solution to global warming. It is a tourniquet that you might need if you decided that the worst consequences of global warming were just too awful to tolerate. And indeed, for natural ecosystems, and I'm not sure we can call anything natural anymore, solar geoengineering may be the only hope they have. But I kind of view it the way Winston Churchill viewed democracy, that it's really the worst possible idea except for the alternative. That basically, uh, that we don't have the governance for it. We don't know how to control it. We don't know who would control it. We don't know what would go wrong. And once you start doing it, you're committed to it. You have to do it for thousands of years. So it is a huge challenge. And yet, indeed, it may be better than the alternative. And so at the very least, I think we need to, to think about it very carefully and study it. All right. Thank you very much, Dan. Yeah. Appreciate it.